where are all these people going? <laughs> Does anybody else have that experience in airports? I don't know what it is about an airport. I'm just like, well, I read recently that at any given time, there are not less than a million people in the air. Right now, in airplanes, there are between one and two million people in the air. Where are they going? <laughs> now, that's my inclination, but then here's the thing that really hits me. Check this out. This is a really liberating idea I'm going to share with you right here. In fact, I had a church member come up to me. One of my church members said to me, David, that is the most liberating thing I have heard in 10 years. And this is it. It's very simple. When you realize that everybody else's reality is just as real to them as your reality is to you, and everybody else's life is just as important to them as your life is to you, it changes the way you see the world. Most of the time, not purposefully, and some people really narcissistically, but, but not purposely, most of the time we sort of see the world like everybody else are playing like supportive roles in the movie that is my life. <laughs> It's really great of you all to show up here tonight in the movie that is The Life and Times of David Ashrick. I'm glad you're here, and it's great. And, and I tell you, we, we can think of people that way, we can see people that way, we can treat people that way, but a, a switch flips in the mind when you realize that all of those people in the airports and all of those people sitting in traffic jams and all of the people that are in this church, everybody's reality is just as real to them and just as important to them as your reality is real and important to you. And I tell you, it is hugely and instantaneously humbling, and it's equalizing. It just instantaneously levels the field, and I sometimes get this little anxiety, like, how is God going to reach all of these people? I mean, here I am. I'm the Christian evangelist, and I'm on the flight to Newark. Who's going to be with those people that are on the flight to Honolulu? Who's going to be, who, how is God going to reach those people that are on the flight to, to Munich? Because I'm on the flight that's going to, and then it dawns on me, wait a minute, God is working for everyone, everywhere, at all times. God is not dependent on David Ashrick. God is not dependent on you. God is not dependent on any one person. God, by his spirit and by the church, is working with everyone, everywhere, at all times. And God sees your reality and your situation and your circumstance just as clearly and as profoundly as you see it yourself. And while we struggle to see others as anything other at times than just basically, you know, role players or supportive actors in our movie, God sees everyone as equally important. He doesn't play favorites. One of my favorite concepts in the New Testament, Old Testament is that God is reaching out to real rascals like Pharaoh. Pharaoh! And God is like extending the hand, the overtures of, of compassion and invitation to Pharaoh. God extends the hand of compassion to King Nebuchadnezzar. Blah, 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 blah. Nebuchadnezzar, the very Babylonian king who was responsible for the destruction of God's city, Jerusalem, the destruction of his temple, and hundreds of thousands of his people. And God's like, you know what, that Nebuchadnezzar guy, I really want to win him. And if I read the book of Daniel right, and I think I am in this regard, Nebuchadnezzar becomes a follower of the true God of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Are you kidding? God is extending the hand of, of compassion and invitation even to a Nebuchadnezzar? If God is looking out for a Nebuchadnezzar and God is looking out for a Pharaoh, then God is looking out for every person on every plane, in every car, in every home, all over the world. He does doesn't play favorites. Now, I think that the church has a giant role to play in communicating God's love and universal fatherly compassion. I think we've got a great role to play, but we shouldn't think for a moment that if we don't do something, nothing will be done. God is in the business of getting his word out to people. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the, the stars and the sun and the moon show his handiwork. Can you say amen? amen. Now, I'm excited. I want to get access to as many people as I can and expose them to the gospel. That's my passion in life. It's my joy in life. It's my mission in life. And probably for many of you, that's the same. But I, don't, I used to carry this anxiety, this like burden around like, oh, man, David, how are you going to reach all these people? How are you? How am I? How are you? And it's a really hard world to live in when you realize there's 7.2 billion people on earth and there is no way you're going to get access to all of them. I don't even speak Mandarin <laughs> or Arabic. 
Oh, I, I only speak one language. Maybe you've heard the joke that if you can speak three languages, you're trilingual. If you can speak two languages, you're bilingual. And if you can speak one language, you're from the United States of America. <laughs> Now increasingly that is not the case because we have a large Hispanic population, but I tell you, white people in the US, they speak one, langu one language, that's English. Now I also speak the language of love, but that's another story. Oh, stop it, stop it. <laughs> All right, look at what the angel says, fear God and give him glory. So not only does he say, not only is he holding the everlasting gospel, the good news about who God is in Jesus, not only is the message for the whole world, he says fear God and give him glory. Well, what does that mean? Here's another literally paradigm-changing concept. Everything you do can be an act of worship. Everything you do, I was recently in British Columbia and I was there for um, a large camp meeting, beautiful camp meeting, a gathering of believers, and uh, there was a, a worship band there, a praise band, and they did a fantastic job. Like the music that they, that they were creating was just, my heart was just drawn out in worship to God. But the, the main uh, song leader was a guy, young man by the name of Josh, 23 or 24 years old, and he, he said something two nights in a row in his leading of worship, and so I, I said, man, I gotta go talk to him. He's young, he's a, he was a new pastor, or maybe he was a theology student, he, was a, he had a tremendous gift in leading worship, but I just said, I mean, I gotta go talk to him, because when he says that, he doesn't know that he's unintentionally sending a really unfortunate message. And what he was saying when he was standing up, he's like, okay, come on, everybody in, come on, we're gonna get started, we're gonna, we're gonna worship, come on, I wanna invite you to come and worship. Okay, now that all sounds really nice. It sounds really good. It sounds really invitational. The problem is, is that it is, it is uh, buttressing and strengthening a fundamental misconception about what worship is in the Christian psyche. Okay, th worship is not singing, you know, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, and all of that. You can worship God that way, absolutely. But that, that is an extension of your life. You're singing when you do that, and singing can be an act of worship. But here's a game changer. Everything you do can be an act of worship. You can sit down to a meal, an amazing meal, and you can eat that meal as an act of worship to God. If you eat that meal and just appreciate the textures and the, and the nuances of flavor, and with every bite, with every chew, you are trying in some conscious way to actively be thinking and thank, thinking of and thanking God, your eating can become an act of worship. Hanging out with your friends. Who doesn't love just hanging out with friends and talking and laughing so hard that your stomach hurts or playing board games or whatever? That can be an act of worship to Jesus if as you're sitting there you have an awareness, wow, I'm surrounded by really beautiful people. This is an amazing thing that I get to do right now. I live in a free country. I'm hanging out with beautiful people. Thank you, Jesus, for this. Now, I don't think you should say, you know, if, you know God, help me to roll a six. Uh, or help me to, you know, help me to, I don't think that's what we're talking about here. But, but you can go surfing. Now, you wouldn't in Colorado. Let me try snow skiing. You can snow ski to the glory of God. Did you know that? Did you know that snow skiing is something that God is intensely interested in? Because it's super fun. And God made you to have lots of fun and to worship him in the joy, in the pleasure, and in the, the glories of life. Did you know that? Everything you do, you get up in the morning and you drink a, a glass of water and you're just like, man, that feels so good. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but just that sensation of that, that first glass of water, you're just like, boom, boom. It's like, it's just like, ah, I'm just like, thank you, Jesus. Drinking a glass of water can be an act of worship. Flying in an airplane can be an act of worship, particularly if it's turbulent. <laughs> Friends, I just want you to get a feel here. Literally everything you do can be an act of worship. And when you start to see your job can be an act of worship, and that's a game changer for a lot of people. You say, you know what? I'm not just here, you know, oh, I hate my job. Or even I tell my sons, they're always like, oh, school this, school that. I'm like, listen, if you don't like school, we'll take you out. Because schools have done a really good job, not always, not all schools, not all teachers, certainly, but a lot of schools have done a really good job at making learning seem like a boring and bad thing when learning is like the most amazing thing in all the universe. And so I tell my boys, look, you were homeschooled until you were 12, and if you don't like school, we'll pull you out because learning is amazing, and I don't want school to ruin learning. There's a whole lot of people that had learning ruined by school. Am I wrong or am I right? Right? Okay, now here's the point. But you can go to school to the glory of God. You can worship God while you're learning something. You can worship God while you're eating something. You can worship God while you're holding your spouse's hand and walking through the park. 
You can work. Life is an act of worship. And what I was saying to that young man, Josh, is don't invite us to start worshiping because what's the implication? Because we weren't right up until that moment. And this is a fundamental misunderstanding in, in many churches and particularly in, in, in certain venues that I'm in. It's like, okay, we weren't worshiping and now the guitar has started, the sound is up and now we're worshiping. Okay, we're worshiping, we're worshiping, we're worshiping, we're worshiping and now the sound is off, the guitar stopped and we don't anymore. As if worship is episodic or, or you know, spontaneous. You know, for most of us, that would mean that we're worshiping what? Just for a few, like what, 15, 20 minutes a week? Right? If you go to church and you sing 20 minutes of songs, right? And, and if your church is anything like my church, half of the men are just like sitting there growling anyway. <laughs> I'm like, hey, that was really good music. Kevin, what would you think of it? <laughs> Loved it. <laughs> Beloved, I just want you to get the feel for this. Everything you do can be an act of worship. When the angel says, fear God and give glory to him, it means these are people that are living their lives to the glory of God. The lowest common denominator in religion is what do I have to do to be saved? That's the lowest common denominator. That's what the rich young ruler came with. Hey, what do I have to do to be saved? He's like, what's the lowest grade I can get and pass? <laughs> really, that's the lowest common denominator. But when you say, I'm not going to ask, what do I have to do in order to get something and start having this economic relationship with God? Let me ask you this. Does that work with your spouse? Uh, sweetie, what is the least that I have to do in order to keep your attention and affection? What is it? <laughs> is it a 15-minute walk, or do I have to, does it have to get into the 20s? <laughs> 22? All right, let's go, let's go 22 then. No, when, when, you, when you have a passion, when you have a love, you're not aiming for the lowest common denominator. You're just living your life for the thing that, that has captured your attention, that has captured your emotions, and that, is, that has captured your affections. That's a totally different animal than a lot of people who have religion by lowest common denominator, just like what's the least that I can do and sneak in, right? Like a church mouse, kind of sneak in. It's not going to work like that. Everything you do can be an act of worship. I love this in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. This is, the Ecclesiastes is like the most de depressing book apart from possibly the book of Judges in the entire Bible until you get to the last two verses. And the last two verses say, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. I love that. Let's hear the conclusion of the matter. This is a man who basically wasted his life. King Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes, and his life was an unmitigated disaster until the very end, right? Like, I just preached, re preached recently on S Solomon, and I know that many people have a really positive view of Solomon, but when you actually read the textual data, uh, the biblical data on Solomon, the guy was a catastrophe, like a total train wreck of a man, and he just righted the ship at the very end which is why Ecclesiastes is an almost uninterrupted, you know, it's like a manual, how to be depressed 101 until you get to the last two verses and it's like, okay, uh, here's the good news, fear God and give glory to him, or rather, uh, fear God and keep his commandments for this is man's all. I've, I've given you a new translation here I'd like to suggest. It's the new David Asherick version. <laughs> I've just changed that very slightly. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and believe his promises. God's commandments are promises. The Ten Commandments are promises. They are promises to you that you don't have to live a life of slavery, you don't have to live a life of bondage, and you don't have to live a life of fear. If you could have another, I'm trying to flip a bunch of switches in your mind here in this seminar. Another mind, flip that you can switch in your mind is don't think about God's commands as commandments. As I said you know, earlier, a crusty old curmudgeon trying to prevent fun everywhere he sees it. Think about God as saying, hey, look, you don't have to live that way anymore. That's what God was saying to the, to the Israelites who came out of Egypt. You don't have to live that way anymore. You don't have to have other gods. You don't have to be hurtful to people. You don't have to lust. You don't have to covet your neighbor's stuff. You don't have to live like that anymore. You can be free now. Right? I brought you out on eagle's wings. You can be free. Didn't Jesus say in the New Testament, if the Son makes you free, you'll be free indeed. Let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and believe his promises. There is a positivity in that. There is a beauty in that, that, that for many of us, we've not even had this religious experience at all. We've not even had a, 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 an experience of God and of Christ and of religion that is anything other than don't, don't, don't. And if you stop doing enough things, then God will be like, all right, I guess you can come in. It's not how it works, friends. When you think, I just want to worship God with all of my heart, mind, and soul, and I want everything I do to be an act of worship, 
Life changes. It changes for the better, the infinitely better. Hans La Rondel says the first angel's message, message seeks to restore the essence, the true, or the essence of true worship. That's what's going on here. He's, he wants people to worship him, and not just when the guitar is playing on Saturday morning or Sunday morning. He wants people to be worshiping him at every moment. You can write a check to the glory of God. You can spend your money to the glory of God. You can exercise. I went on a two-hour bike ride today, and I tell you, my cycling rides, it used to be running, but then I injured myself. Not running. I injured myself in a water skiing accident. I hate water skiing. I hate all motorsports. No offense. I just cannot, I can't get into things with motors, but I was in Redding, California, which is where my wife's family's from, and I don't know why anybody would voluntarily live there. It was 121 degrees. It was July 1st, and they were like, hey, we're going to go to the lake. And I'm like, of course you're going to go to the lake. It's the only thing you can do <laughs> in July and August here. And so they're like, we go to the lake, and you get there, and I'm just like sitting in the water, you know, feeling like an amphibian and just, you know, trying not to, you know, have, die of heat stroke. And they're like, hey, you want to get pulled in behind the boat? I'm like, no, nope, no interest. No, nope. it's my sons, actually. Hey, do you want to come behind the boat? I'm like, no, nope, not interested. Like, come on, dad, come on. Nope, nope, nope. Finally, they talked me into it like a fool. I succumbed to peer pressure. I said no to cigarettes. I said no to alcohol. I said no to drugs. But I said yes to this silly motorboat. <laughs> and uh, anyway, ended up spinning off of it, smashed my knees together, severely injured my medial collateral ligament, laid me up for six months. You guys might remember that. I was sort of limping around the last time I was here. But, but so I got out of running and I, I got into cycling. Cycling is amazing. I wish I would have discovered it 20 years ago. It's like the joy of my life right now, cycling. I feel like, I was actually thinking this today while I was out cycling, that there are few joys in life greater than moving across the earth, whether it's running, whether it's over land or water, moving across the earth under your own power. I just, my, I almost feel sorry for people who don't do it with regularity, whether it's walking, if running is too difficult, or running, or cycling, or kayaking, or stand-up paddleboarding, or cross-country skiing, or snowshoeing. There are few things in life more enjoyable than getting your heart rate up and moving across the earth, whether on water or land, under your own power. And uh, I, I just, I urge all of you, start exercising. In fact, here's a book you need to get. You, you, you need to read this book. Whether you're 85 here tonight or 15, you need to read this book. It ch it's going to change your life, change my life. It's called Spark. That's it. You'll, you won't forget that. Spark by John Ratey, R-A-T-E-Y. Anybody here read the book? Spark. You need to read this book. It is a life changing book. Spark by John Rady. He is a senior neurologist at Harvard University, and he writes a cutting-edge book on the neurology of exercise. And here's the short version. Old-school thinking on exercise is that you exercise to benefit your body, right? Whether it's, uh, you know, your musculature or your cardiovascular system or to look more fit. He said, that's old-school thinking. Old school thinking is you do exercise because it benefits your body. He said, we now know that the number one, two, th and three reasons that you exercise is to benefit your brain. And any bodily benefit that you get in terms of, you know, more flexibility, more musculature, more cardiovascular fitness, that is a byproduct of the real reason that you exercise. Everything from delaying the onset of Alzheimer's to better cognitive function to overcoming depression, if they could take exercise and put it in a pill, it would be the most popular drug in the world. Okay? Now, I'm going to tell you something else here. I'm telling you this because I love you. This is not something like, well, I really should exercise. When you actually start exercising, it becomes one of the greatest joys in your life. And I'm going to tell you this right now. If you are not getting 30 minutes of vigorous exercise five times a week, you're not doing it right. Now, doesn't, I don't care what you do. Like, I have no particular burden. 30 minutes of elevated heart rate five times a week. You have to do it. It's better to do it seven times a week, but at least five times a week. Okay? Now, if you don't want to be fit and you want to get cancer and you want to die early, I can tell you how to do that too. It's really easy to get cancer. All you have to do is the three S's. Okay? You do the three S's and you can get cancer. You sit, you eat sugar, and you stress. That is, the, that is the recipe for cancer. So if you would like to get cancer of some variety, strife or form, then you can sit, you can stress, and you can eat lots of sugar. Now, if you, if you don't do those things, it doesn't mean you won't get cancer, but why not stock, stack the odds in your favor? And then here's the cool thing. When, this, I got all into all of that because I was talking about cycling. I was out cycling today, and I was thinking, <laughs> I was thinking, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just, God, you are so awesome. You are so amazing. I get as much... 
spiritual energy. I get as much connection with Christ from riding my bike as I do from praying. I just, I'm just out there. My heart is beating. I'm just thinking about God. I'm thinking about his goodness. I'm also praying half the time, not praying that I won't get hit by a car. I'm not worried about that. Praying for my friends, praying for my family. I'm, just, I'm pleading with you guys. Take control of your health, your physical, mental, and spiritual health. Start exercising. You want to be a better Christian? This is going to sound crazy. Exercise. True story. You want to be a better believer? Get 30 minutes of vigorous exercise five times a week. Do you want to be a better parent? Do you want to be a better husband? Do you want to be a better father? Do you want to be a better disciple? Start exercising. Your brain will work better, and when your brain works better, your spirit works better. When your spirit works better, your, whole, your life works better. When your brain works better, your body works better. Trust me. Trust me. It's very difficult to maintain. Not difficult. It's, it's unnecessarily difficult to maintain the level of spiritual connection that you could have by just sitting around and eating a bunch of sugar and junk food and not taking care of yourself. I'm pleading with you, get fit, not just for fitness sake, but for your spirit's sake, for services sake, for your health's sake, for your children's sake, for your spouse's sake, and for the kingdom of God's sake. True story. Exercise is an act of worship. Okay, in my church I was saying you can even have sex to the glory of God and all the men were like, what, did he just say that? And I had all of these ladies that were like, whoa, I cannot believe you just said that. Now every time my husband's coming to me, he's like, hey, sweetie. <laughs> Let's worship. I'm telling you, you can do anything to the glory of God. And then finally, worship the Creator. The heaven, or the hour of judgment has come. I'm not final. I've got to hurry up here. According to Daniel 7, according to Daniel chapter 7 and 9, judgment comes after the 1260 prophecy and before the second coming of Jesus. So Jacques de Conn in his Daniel, a vision of the end, says, the vision of Daniel chapter 7 and the three angels' messages of Revelation 14 are then situated at the same level in the prophetic line. The judgment in heaven predicted in Daniel 7 and the shout of the three, angel, the three messengers of Revelation 14 coincide. Now the reason that this is important is that the angels say the hour of his judgment has come. That's present tense. This is very important because when you read the New Testament, you find phrases like this again and again. Paul was speaking in, uh, in Acts chapter 24, and he said, Now as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered and said, Go away for now. When I have a more convenient time, I will call for you. Paul was looking forward to the judgment. Now look at this. In Romans chapter 2, verse 16, God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Future. It's future. There's lots of these. Acts chapter 7, 17, verse 31. Because he has appointed the day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance to us all by raising him from the dead. So it's always future. When you're in the New Testament, judgment is future. Judgment is future. Will come, judgment to come, shall judge. But here's a really cool thing. Biblically speaking, the judgment is super good news. Super, super, super good news. And I want to apologize to you on behalf of all of the preachers that you've heard over the years that have made judgment seem like something to be really scared of, like really bad news, like something that you should be freaking out about. Not in Scripture. Not in Scripture. Check this out. The, 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 probably the, the most significant judgment seen in all of the uh, Bible is Daniel chapter 7. And the, the outcome of that courtroom scene is verse 22 of Daniel chapter 7. The Ancient of Days, that's God the Father, pronounced judgment... And notice those next two words. What are the next two words? In favor of the saints of the Most High. And what's the outcome of that pronouncement of favor? They came and possessed the kingdom. The judgment is not bad news. In fact, I'll share, I'll share another, just like a total light switch moment. I think you're getting like five light switches tonight turn on. I hope, I hope some lights will turn on in there. And in my own life too, by the way, I need these lights which turn on. I'm not talking down to you, I'm talking across to you. And in some cases, I'm speaking up to you because some of you are further ahead on some of these issues maybe than I am. But check this out. This is a game-changing concept right here. I came across this concept this year, literally changed my life. Jesus brought an end of history event into the middle of history. I actually, I wrote that wrong. It should say, Jesus brought an end of history event into the middle of history. Never mind the of Jesus part there. I was probably going to write it in a different way. So the idea here is that Jesus took an end of history event and brought it into the middle of history. What am I talking about? The grand climax of the book of Daniel is right here in Daniel chapter 12. 
You want to you see the big, the big story? The, you know, as the crescendo, the violins are going and the, and the, it's building, the symphony is building, and it's the big moment, the big symphonic moment in the book of Daniel. Here it is. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. Okay, here it comes. Everyone whose name is found written in the book, that's the book of life, will be delivered. Woo! Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. That is the resurrection. That is the climax. The grand climax of the book of Daniel is that the righteous who have passed away and the righteous yet future who will die will be resurrected. God has not forgotten them. They will be raised. Now, this is key. In Jewish thinking, resurrection is an end of history event. Daniel. That's the climax, the end. When the whole thing is done and dusted, the, the, you know, the final act in the human drama is that God saves, he resurrects, he redeems his people, body, mind, and spirit, right? So resurrection in Jewish thinking is an end of history event. It's a what event? Yes. End of history. When was Jesus resurrected? In the middle of history. God did something phenomenal. He took an end of history event and put it and plopped it right down in the middle of history. Why? To give you the absolute assurance, the absolute assurance that he had conquered sin and death and that the resurrection works. If you have put your faith in Jesus, your end of history event is secured by a middle of history moment. The resurrection right in the middle of history should give you the robust assurance that the resurrection works, that Jesus has conquered sin and death, and if your faith is in him, your future resurrection is guaranteed and secure because Jesus' resurrection has already happened. And he is a represent. This is a mind-blowing concept. Look at this. The grand climax of Daniel's amazing prophetic book is the end-time resurrection, right? I think that's the last one I've got there. Oh, yeah, you're right there. Is the end-time resurrection. So, and so Jesus comes, puts a middle of history, uh, an end of history event right in the middle of history, and you and I can have total peace tonight that Jesus' resurrection and his conquering of sin and death will be effectual in our own lives if we have placed our faith in him. More precisely, if we have believed that he has accomplished what Scripture says he has accomplished, if we believe in his faithfulness. But we'll get to that more in more detail on Wednesday. I'll skip over that part. Okay. And then finally, worship the Creator. Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him that made the heaven, the earth, the sea. And we've been over this. The heaven, the earth, and the sea is extracted straight out of the Sabbath commandment, the fourth commandment, the fourth promise of the Ten Commandments. Uh, in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 to 11, we've read that. Numerous worship psalms also have this threefold formula of heaven, earth, and sea, 69, 96, 146. In the early church, they worshiped God, the Creator, the one who'd made the heaven, the earth, and the sea. And that, that language comes up again also in Revelation. We see it here in chapter 14. Quoting this, uh, the last quotation, you have survived, uh, from Hans La Rendell. We've quoted this before. I'm going to quote it again. This calls all people to worship God as creator. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of waters, Revelation 14, 7. The final religious issue in human history is thus defined as worshiping the creator in spirit and truth. Close comparison of the oath formula with the fourth commandment shows that both mention the elements of heaven, earth, and sea. The oath of Revelation 10, however, puts an unusual emphasis on the all-comprehensive nature of God's created work because it says the heaven and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in them, the sea and all that is in them. Repeating three times the phrase, and all that is in them, this compels us to acknowledge an intentional pointer to the oath of the covenant angel in the oath of the covenant angel to the fourth commandment. This indicates where the concerns of heaven are for the universal church of Christ and for her worship of God in the time of the end. And it contains the motivation for true revival and reformation. These are two books that need to be in your library. They not only need to be in your library, as I've mentioned before, they need to be read. They don't do you any good if they're just sitting on the shelf. Now, I've brought one of them here tonight. This is a book called The Sabbath by Abraham Joshua Heschel. He is a Jew, was a Jewish rabbi. He passed away in the mid-70s. Has anybody read this book? This is a game-changing book. Am I right? Game-changing book. And because I know that some of you will not heed my advice and buy it, I'm going to read it, the whole book to you tonight. No, not the whole book. <laughs> 
I'm going to read you the. I'm going to read you a few paragraphs from the opening chapter. Listen to what he says. Speaking of the Sabbath, the book is simply titled The Sabbath. The other book there, The Lost Meaning of the Seventh Day by Sigve Tonstad, you should own as well. I just saw today, by the way, uh, I would call Tonstad a friend of mine. I don't know him well, but I would, I would call him a friend. I just saw today that his book has, I think, 44 reviews on Amazon.com, and all of them are five stars. It is an exceptional book. It is the modern classic on the Sabbath. But listen to what, listen to what Heschel says. This is the opening paragraph of his book, The Sabbath. Modern civilization is man's conquest of space. It is a triumph frequently achieved by sacrificing an essential ingredient, ingredient of existence, namely time. In technical civilization, we expend time to gain space. To enhance our power in the world of space is our main objective. Yet to have more does not mean to be more. The power we attain in the world of space terminates abruptly at the border of time. But time is the heart of existence. To gain control of the world of space is certainly one of our tasks. But the danger begins when in gaining power in the realm of space, we forfeit all aspirations in the realm of time. There is a realm of time where the goal is not to have, but to be. Not to own, but to give. Not to control, but to share. Not to subdue, but to be in harmony. Life goes wrong when the conquest and control of space and the acquisition of things becomes our sole concern. He goes on to say, we must not forget, this is awesome, we must never forget that it is not a thing that lends significance to a moment. It is the moment that brings significance to things. And then the final section here I'll read to you. He says, in contrast, the Sabbath is entirely independent of the month and it is unrelated to the moon. Its date is not determined by any event in nature, such as the new moon, but by an act of creation. Thus, the essence of the Sabbath is completely detached from the world of space. The meaning of the Sabbath is to celebrate time rather than space. Six days a week, we live under the tyranny of the things of space. But on Sabbath, we become attuned to holiness in time. It is a day on which we are called upon to share in what is eternal in time, to turn from the results of creation to the mystery of creation, from the world of creation to the creation of the world. Friends, I tell you, something happens in Sabbath that is absolutely transformative. First of all, it communicates a total realignment of your priorities, and that's what Heschel's getting at here. We live in a world that is consumed with stuff, material things. In fact, consumerism has been identified as a worldview now. Consumerism is a worldview. More stuff, more clothes, more toys, more gadgets, more electronics, more land, more whatever. Whatever your more is, okay? My more has been fly fishing rods and, I'm being really vulnerable with you here, uh, camera equipment and now bicycles. That's my more, right? And there is a temptation in the heart of David Asherick to want more than what I have. I want uh, that, uh, the newer, the latest, the greatest, the best, the whatever. You have your own more that you might be tempted by, right? But, but what Sabbath says is, Sabbath says is it's not about owning more stuff that's extended in space. Sabbath is about being in time and turning your attention away from the things of space. And I tell you, this is timely advice in this day and age where consumerism has become the driving force in the world. More, newer, shinier, better, quicker, faster. I mean, how many people, the moment that iPhone 7 comes out or whatever the new phone is, the new gadget, all of a sudden, the 6 just seems so totally unattractive and ancient. Like, what, did they find this thing in an archaeological dig somewhere around Jerusalem? Look at this thing. It doesn't even have the new camera. Right? Well, never mind 10 years ago. You didn't even know what an iPhone was or 12 years ago, whatever it is. The point here is that the Sabbath demands contentedness. It teaches to be satisfied. It, it, it changes 
everything. And the coolest thing about it is this. This is my favorite thing. If there was a space that was holy, like a holy mountain or a holy shrine or a holy river, as most religions have holy places, then you can be kept from getting exposed to holiness by someone preventing you from going to that holy space. If you're not of able body or if you can't catch a flight or if you don't have enough money, you can be kept from holiness because holiness is located over there. You could plot that holy spot on a GPS map. But with the Sabbath, it's not some space, not some location, not some river, not some mountain that's holy. It's time that's holy. And here's the coolest thing. You cannot stay away from it. It comes to you. The coolest thing about Sabbath is that it teaches us the great truth of righteousness by faith. You can't do anything to earn it. It just comes to you. And when it comes to you, you receive it as a gift. A total reorientation. I tell you, if you want to get control in the area of space and things and material goods, things that are extended in space, the number one way to do it is to keep Sabbath, to worship the God of time, to be content, to be happy, to be satisfied in being with God. And so there it is. Worship the Creator. Jesus brought an end of history event into the middle of history. Put your faith in Jesus his testimony and his resurrection. Learn to worship and glorify him in everything that you do. He is your creator and your savior. Rest in his love and in his Sabbath. The invitation of the first angel's message is all of that and so much more. Tonight has been just a, 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 a sort of uh, glance at the first angel's message. It is, there is a depth far below and far deeper than what I have dove, d dove into tonight, but it gives you a feel that God is calling for you it's not just a religious ceremonialism where you do and you don't and you stop and you start. And It's not that. God wants you. He wants your time. He wants your person. He wants your energies. He wants your thought. He wants your body, which belongs to him anyway, by the way. That's one of the reasons you need to exercise. That body doesn't belong to you. It's not yours. I know you think it's yours and you act like it's yours, but it's not yours. It belongs to God. God gave it to you, and he wants you to take good care of it in the same way that if I lent you my car, I'd be like, hey, take good care of my car. Don't wreck it. Take good care of it. God wants your body. He wants your mind. He wants your time. And not because he's like, you better give it to me or else, but because he loves you. He loves you. And he wants you to love him too. Should we pray together? Father in heaven, it has been great to be here tonight. I have, I have thoroughly enjoyed discussing and, and just being enthusiastic about the first angel's message. And Father, it is a great message. Will there be people that will resist the beastly confederacy that is described in Revelation? Yes, there will be a people. Father, will there be people even right now at this day and age that will resist the tyranny of the world and the tyranny of, of its busyness and its consumerism and its massive consumer debt and its dissatisfaction with what we have and a longing for oh, the next greatest thing? Father, help us to be content to be happy, to be at peace. And Father, that is a peace that we cannot generate from within us internally. It is a peace that can only come from you, a peace that passes understanding. Father, we want to be those people that at the end of time, and even right now in this time, of course, I think we're living right near the very end of time, but Father, be that as it may. I pray that we would be a people, the people right here that are either listening on the video or in the, in the church this evening in the sound of my voice, that they would say, you know what? When the clock stops ticking and this whole thing winds up, whether it's at the second coming or at the last beat of my own heart, I want to know that I prioritized God in a way that is at least dimly reflective of the way that he has prioritized me. Help us to that end is my prayer, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you all. We'll do the question and answers next time because I've kept you already pretty late tonight. So be ready for the Q&A on Wednesday. We'll see you all then, 6.30. Jamie, you want to send us off with a blessing? You always have great stuff to say. <laughs> How many of you enjoyed our study tonight? Yeah. All right. On your phone, Wednesday evening, 6.30. Go ahead and put it in your calendar and plan on being back here. You know, one of the things that I love that David talked about was about judgment and it being not something we need to be scared of. I think that is something that is so key 
as we look at, at who God is. So many people freak out about that and, and get so nervous about that. But I think it's one of the most graceful things that God does is get rid of evil in our world. And it shows just how much God loves each and every one of us and is preparing a place for us where we don't have to worry about things anymore. We got so much more to study. Next time we meet, we'll beginning, be beginning our third installment together, our third section. And again, it will be Wednesday evening, Thursday evening, Friday evening, and Sabbath morning, 10 o'clock and 11.15 on Saturday morning. So I'm so glad you were here this week to study. Plan on being here Wednesday. If you know somebody who would enjoy studying the Bible and digging deep, bring them on Wednesday. God bless each one of you. Have a great evening and a safe trip home. We'll see you on Wednesday. Bye-bye.